Hey everyone, welcome back and welcome to the Humankind's Classical Era tier list. We're going to be covering all of the Classical Era cultures this time around. Of course, this is part of a series. We're going to be looking at all the cultures in all the different eras, and I already posted the video on the Ancient Era cultures about a week ago. I apologize for the delay in getting this online. There were some uh, circumstances that prevented me from recording for several days, but now I'm back and we'll be back to our regular sort of upload schedule with a video hopefully every day or every other day. I did cover some things in the ancient era tier list that I'm not going to repeat here, including things like abbreviations I'll use and what defined tiers and all that kind of stuff. But before we hop into this, I would like to make a note of something very important in the classical era, which is that there is a really a lack of uh, generic military units in the classical. All you get are swordsmen and horsemen. And this affects how I'm going to be tiering things because the importance of the emblematic unit for each culture increases quite dramatically because the units you have access to is actually very limited, at least for units that are you know up to date for the classical era. So the importance of emblematic units of the different cultures is going to increase very substantially for classical era cultures relative to cultures in other eras. So uh, that being said, Let's just jump right in and get to the Achaemenid Persians. So the Achaemenid Persians have the legacy trait plus two city cap and plus sensibility on city or outpost. The plus sensibility is really just a rider. Uh, you know, it'll help you get a slightly larger city than you would be able to otherwise. But the real effect here is the plus two city cap. The Achaemenids have the ability very early in the game to set up a lot of cities. And that's really important. The sooner you get cities, the sooner you're producing more outputs, the sooner you take them off the AI, the sooner you can optimize them effectively rather than just having a bunch of random districts and infrastructure. So normally when you go over the city cap, right, you pay an influence cost in order to sustain cities. Being one over the cap is usually manageable, uh, except very, very early in the game. But being one over the cap is like a minus 10 influence penalty. Being two over the cap is something like a minus 110 influence penalty, or it, it might have even been adjusted upwards, something like 120. So being one over your city cap uh, in the classical era will put most cultures at four cities. Being one over the city cap for the Achaemenids will put you at six cities. And the Achaemenids have the tools in their toolbox to be able to take over cities relatively easily. So you're going to be able to make effective use of this pretty much every single game, right? The earlier you get cities, the earlier you have them producing outputs, the earlier you are able to collect stars and fame and ultimately win the game. So honestly, the plus two city cap is probably the best legacy traits in the era. Um, it, I find it hard to uh, put any other legacy trait on the same level as this, simply because the more production queues you have, the more population queues, uh, population growth you have, you know, across more cities, the easier the game is going to be. So let's talk about the Satrap Palace, which is the emblematic quarter. The Satrap Palace is basically a uh, market quarter that provides a little bit more base money as well as uh, a little bit of extra influence. So you get some influence per adjacent district. Uh, so, you know, you can get up to something like plus 13 influence, I think, including the base if it's fully surrounded. And with market quarters, you do want to do that. You get a lot of bonuses from having adjacent market quarters, right? They kind of feed off each other. So you plop this down in a few cities where you're planning on making market quarters, where you're planning on specializing in your money income so that you can get your money stars. And, you know, you get some extra influence and a little bit of extra money. It's okay. You know, it's just a better market quarter, which is not an amazing quarter to have. Um... But with the Satrap Palace, and if you make a little bit of investment into market quarters, you're able to get at least one or two of the money stars as the Achaemenids, and get one or two of the Esthete stars. Since the Achaemenids are expansionists, it means that the influence and money requirements for those respective stars are not inflated like they would be if you were an Esthete or a Merchant. So it does help you get those even though money is not the most effective thing in terms of uh, FIMS, just because the cost to actually buy things starts scaling up pretty hard, uh, particularly later in the classical era. 
Earlier in the classical era, it's still a little bit more manageable, but unless you hard focus gold, it can be pretty difficult to make use of money very effectively. So the Satrap Palace, I would say, is it's just an okay quarter. Um, the influence is still going to be relevant, and if the changes go through that are currently in beta that dramatically increase the cost of uh, outpost placements, the Satrap Palace may start looking a little bit better for that extra influence generation. But, you know, I'm rating this as the game is currently rather than proposed changes from the beta. So right now it's just a slightly better market quarter. So let's talk about the Immortals, uh, which are the emblematic unit. And the Immortals um, are one of the best units in the era. There's one other unit that, uh, you know, I, I would say could take the title. You could go back and forth on it. But the Immortals are a 180 production cost, 28 combat strength spearmen, basically. So they get the anti-cavalry bonus, which is plus 8 rather than plus 5, like it currently says on the wiki. And uh, that's against mounted enemies, so that includes things like horsemen, you know, scout riders, elephant units, all that kind of stuff. They also have the uh, Bastion trait, which gives them plus three combat strength when they're on high ground or when they're in a fortified position. So, you know, when they're uh, defending a city or a garrison or something like that. And critically, they only have a resource requirement of one copper. So when you pick the Achaemenids, you're going to know if you have access to that copper so you can produce immortals. And if you don't have copper, then you might not want to pick the Achaemenids, right? Thankfully, copper is uh, relatively common and fairly easy to come by, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Now, what makes the immortals so good in the classical era is that they don't have a counter, really. The closest thing you get to a classical era counter to the Immortals is the Samnahaya because it is a ranged unit. However, it is an elephant unit. So if the Immortals get to it, they're going to shred it very easily because of the anti-cavalry bonus. And if you're playing the Morians with the Samnahaya, it means you don't have a very strong front line, right? You're relying on swordsmen. And the Immortals outclass swordsmen in terms of combat strength. Now, if you're playing on Humankind difficulty, Immortals are approximately equal to Swordsmen uh, in combat strength uh, with that plus two that the AI Swordsmen would have. However, the Immortals um, all have Bastion, right? So you get that extra plus three when you're on high ground. And being on high ground itself gives you plus four. And it's very easy to abuse high ground against the AI. And uh, particularly against Cavalry units, your Immortals can pretty easily one-shot them a lot if you are taking advantage of those high ground positions. It's really important to uh, use the terrain to your advantage if you're playing the Achaemenids. It's going to be more difficult if you're playing like multiplayer where you know your opponents are actually smart. But against the AI, it's really easy to abuse Bastion and high ground, and it really elevates the Immortals to this position where it's almost impossible for the AI to deal with them effectively if you have you know, more than just a couple randomly lying around. You can have entire armies just 100% Immortals, and they're totally combat effective. So Immortals, you know, they don't really have a counter. They're great on offense and defense. So uh, excellent unit. And because of that, and the city cap really is the reason I'm putting the Achaemenids in the S tier. They have the city cap to go out and, you know, get a bunch of early cities that they are effectively able to support without any influence or stability penalties. They have the tool they need to do that in the Immortals, which doesn't really have a counter in the Classical Era, which makes it obscenely strong, particularly against the AI where you can abuse terrain. The Emblematic Quarter is, it's okay. It gives you a little bit of extra money to help you get your Air Stars. It gives you a little bit of extra influence to help you get your Air Stars. It may be a little bit better after some future changes, particularly those proposed in the beta. Uh, but for now, I'd say the Emblematic Quarter is just okay. You're not going to build it in every single city. You'll build it in cities where, you know, you're specializing in money. But in those cities, it is still worth building. So the Achaemenids simply by virtue of being able to sustain more cities and being able to effectively capture those cities through the use of their emblematic unit. I mean, the Achaemenids are an easy S tier. It's pretty much the culture I try to pick every single game. I think they're my most picked culture out of any era. Uh, 
So next, let's talk about the Aksumites, who are a merchant culture. And the Aksumites get the legacy trait plus two money on tile producing money. Now, this looks similar to something like the Harappans or the Egyptians legacy traits, where they get, you know, extra yields on a given tile producing food or uh, production. The difference with the Aksumites is that there aren't really any tiles that natively produce money. So this is really just applying to quarters for the most part. So when you build like a market quarter, for instance, you get an extra plus two money on top of whatever it was producing. This, it, it's okay. Um, you know, the fact that you don't really have any natural tiles that produce money really decreases the value of this, right? You have to make an investment in order for this to have a return. So you have to be investing a lot in market quarters. And it's kind of overshadowed by things like gemstones, right? The luxury resource that provides money on market quarters, right? If you have access to gemstones, it's better than this legacy trait. Or if you get the uh, religious tenant that gives you plus five money on market quarters, it's better than this legacy trait. So, uh, you know, obviously you can combine those things to increase your money even farther, uh, but the legacy trait is basically accessible to anyone in the game in a better form without having to pick the X mines. So it's a nice boost just passively. I don't think it actually provides enough money as a legacy trait, uh, just because of how limited the number of tiles that actually produce money are, as specifically market quarters and you know some emblematic quarters. So you know it's okay. It'll help you get a little bit more money than you would otherwise have. But you know even if you have 50 market quarters, this is still only providing you plus 100 money per turn, and you're definitely not going to have 50 market quarters in the classical era. So by the time it, you know, it's super relevant that like plus 100 money per turn with 50 market quarters, you might have that in like industrial, you'll be making thousands of money per turn. So yeah, it's, I don't value this one very much. I think it's pretty mediocre. It could probably be like plus four money on tile producing money and would still be totally balanced in my personal opinion, just based on the cost of buyouts, right? Everyone at this point has noticed that, you know, buyout costs are really, really incredibly expensive. And particularly like finishing like the last five production on uh, on like a quarter or a unit or something can cost hundreds of gold. So, you know, there's no way that one production is each worth like 200 gold or something like that. So money itself is also not very valuable. So when you have these legacy traits that are providing you money, they need to provide more money than their equivalent for like food and production and science because those outputs are a little bit better a lot of the time. Food is a little bit questionable, but definitely production and science on a one-to-one -one basis are worth more than money is. So particularly since I mentioned there aren't any other tiles producing money other than quarters, um, it makes it hard to justify this over like literally just having the like the Harappans or the um, Egyptians legacy trait from the previous era. Those are straight up better than the, the Aksumite's legacy trait. So, you know, it's okay. You get a little extra money from it, but ultimately it's, it's fairly disappointing just because of how much it costs to actually buy things. So next, let's talk about the emblematic quarter. And this is actually one of my favorite emblematic quarters in the game. Uh, not necessarily because it's the best one, uh, but because of how it interacts with other mechanics. So it provides a little bit of faith, a little bit of base, base money, as well as the plus two from the legacy trait. So it's five base money. Like any other market quarter, you get some money adjacency with the great obelisk. But where this great obelisk really starts providing you with income is from the plus one money per territories under the religion's influence. So every territory that is the majority your religion, you get an extra one money from that. Um, this perhaps doesn't sound amazing, but you would be surprised at how much money a great obelisk can actually generate. I, you will generate more money from a small handful of great obelisks than you will from the uh, the Axumite's legacy trait, even with like dozens of market quarters. Uh, 
And the reason for this is that it's really easy to spread your religion. The AI aren't particularly effective at doing that. Now, this might change uh, with the beta. If anyone's played on the beta, you know that there have been changes to your initial faith. I believe it's like animism and shamanism now. And the faith output from uh, those are much decreased. So it used to be like plus five faith per territory, you know, per attached territory or plus one faith per population. Now it's, I think it's like plus five faith basically on your main plaza and plus one faith per attached territory, something like that. So your faith output is dramatically decreased in the beta. So once those changes go through, there's going to be a bit of a tug of war, right? Because it makes it harder for you to have established religious dominance early in the game to make a lot of money out of the Great Obelisk. But at the same time, the fact that the Great Obelisk provides faith may be more important as well. So upcoming changes, we'll see how it plays out. But as it is right now, you know, you can pretty easily get the Great Obelisk up to like 30 to 40 gold per turn, uh, just because you can be so dominant in your religion. And with multiple of these, you can produce several hundred gold per turn. And I've actually surprisingly found that the Aksumites were largely able to support, uh, you know, all the money I needed in order to provide for my military units pretty much throughout the entire game without ever having to pick another culture. Uh, because the Great Obelisk will continue to scale as your religion expands, you're going to continue to get more and more money as the game goes on. And once you, you know, drop down some market quarters adjacent to it and all that, you know, you can generate a pretty sizable amount of cash. Now, that money obviously is not as valuable as production because of the cost of actually buying things out right? It's still a little too much, in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, at least the Great Obelisk has the potential to generate you a fair amount of money. You'll definitely generate more money from the Great Obelisk than you'll generate production from, you know, like a Kothan or the Mines of Momentic Quarter, the Kuna. Uh, those are, uh, they have less scaling potential than the Great Obelisk does. I still don't think, you know, in general, money is as worthwhile as the other outputs, but at least this provides you a decent amount of it. Obviously, if your religion is bad, <laughs> you know, it hasn't spread very far, the Aksumites are not a good pick. The Great Obelisk is basically the reason you pick the Aksumites. It's probably the strongest part about their culture. Um, and, you know, it'll provide you a decent amount of money if you've invested in your, in your religion game. So let's talk about the uh, Shodalai, or Shodalai, how, however you say this. And uh, this is basically a swordsman uh, with plus one combat strength, you know, still has the same production cost of 90 production, still has the one iron requirement. The difference is that it has the effect grappler. So it has a larger zone of control and it can't be ignored. So basically this is a hard counter to the Hunnic Hordes. Um, if, if you are the Hunnic Hordes, the Shodalai is like the last thing that you want to see. Because you can't make effective use of running in and running out. Um, you know, you're, you can't ignore the zone of control. Um, so it makes it difficult to get up to the enemy front line, shoot, and then run away to where they can't get you again. So uh, this is really good against AI Hunnic Hordes. Uh, unfortunately, it's not very good against pretty much everything else. And this comes back to the fact that its combat strength is relatively low compared to some of the other options available in the era. And the fact that a lot of the good uh, units of the era are mounted units, right? So things like the War Elephant, the Samnahaya, Gothic Cavalry. These are all things that are, you know, benefit from having anti-cavalry when you're fighting against them. And the Shodalai don't have that. So the Shodalai is kind of... Um, it is better than a swordsman because it has that plus one combat strength and because it has this extra effect that makes it harder for your enemy to cycle units around. The issue when you're playing single player is that the AI suck at that, right? Unless they're playing the Hans. They don't do a lot of unit cycling. They kind of plop all their units on the front line and they ram into you with their higher combat strength. And the Shodalai doesn't really help you stop that. It does have that extra combat strength over a swordsman, like I said before. But that plus one, you know, your enemy swordsmen still have higher combat strength than your, your emblematic unit does. And, you know, unless you're... Uh, on high ground, right, you're you're not going to surpass them. So 
it's kind of put in this position where it's like a good counter to one very specific unit. And there are situations where the Hunnic Hordes might actually have more combat strength than your Shodolai, depending on uh, events and cultures that have been chosen and all that kind of stuff. So even in those situations, it can be a little bit touch and go. Um, like, it's an okay unit. I don't, like, I don't hate the unit. I don't hate having it. It's just that compared to some of the other options available, it's not as good at letting you survive the classical era. And that's important because in the classical era is really when the AI are at their height of their advantage against the player. Because the fact that the player is able to optimize their infrastructure and district placement is still not as relevant as the massive bonuses that the AI get to all their outputs. They're always going to be able to outproduce you at this point in the game. They're going to have more food, more production, more science because of all the bonuses that they get. Uh, with with very few exceptions. There are a couple exceptions, like uh, if you're using Land Razor or the science mode as a scientist. But you, you're not going to be able to outproduce the AI, so you need to take advantage of quality, high combat strength units and superior tactics in order to uh, counter enemy armies. And the Shodolai doesn't provide you the tools you need to really do that, except kind of against the Huns. Everyone else, you know, they just have their giant front line of units that they just ram into you using their higher combat strength. So um, it, it doesn't provide you those sort of tactical uh, tools that you really want in the classical era. So it's okay. It's better than the swordsman. You'll still build it. So ultimately, I, I put the Axumites in the B tier. Like, everything about them is, you know, it's okay. Like, plus two money on tile producing money. The Great Obelisk, um, you know, is a little bit better than okay. It can scale fairly well throughout the game. The Shodolai, again, it's a swordsman replacement that has, like, plus one combat strength and effects that's, you know, marginally useful against certain AI factions, but ultimately doesn't really matter that much. It is more useful in multiplayer where people are smart, but, you know, I'm basing this on, on single player, so... Uh, at any rate, so everything about the Axumites is, like, okay to decent, and, you know, I feel that fits with B tier, right? Like, they're, in most situations, in most games, you can pick the Axumites and do decently well. Get a decent amount of money, have an okay unit that'll help you kind of survive the classical era. At least it's better than Swordsmen, right? And it's kind of a counter to Hordes, which are one of the biggest threats to the classical era. So I think B tier is an appropriate position for them. So let's talk about the Carthaginians. Carthaginians are a merchant culture, and they get the legacy trait that they modify the constructible buyout cost by minus 25%. This is a little bit misleading because this is actually all constructible buyout costs, so that includes influence purchase costs on outpost as well as population buyout cost. So it's not just for money. So that does help it a little bit, but ultimately isn't super important. Obviously, the reason you're picking this is for the money buyout cost. That's the most relevant because it's the thing you'll be doing by far the most often compared to the other buyouts. Um, it's, a, it's a decent legacy trait. Um, this used to be minus 50%, which was insane, and money costs used to be much lower as well. Now, this does help bring you know, the cost of a buyout a little bit more in line with what I feel it should be. But, you know, if you have 10 production left on a, a I don't know, 400 production district, it's still costing you like 400 gold to buy that out and the Carthaginians modify that down to 300 gold. Does that make a buyout strategy more viable relative to other strategies? I mean, a little bit, but ultimately your production is way more important still, even after considering the buyout cost reduction from the Carthaginians legacy trait. So, you know, if you are pursuing a super hard gold-based strategy, you're trying to pick a merchant in like every single era that it's available, you can amass enough gold that it is somewhat viable, but still not competitive as if you had focused production. And the Carthaginians do play a major role in allowing you to do that. And we'll talk about the Kothan in a second here, but the legacy trait doesn't actually allow the Carthaginians to 
take advantage of the legacy traits in the era in which they get it because they don't have any innate ways to generate gold themselves. They are a merchant culture, so you know you can do some trade to get a little bit of gold. But you know their Kothan doesn't generate any gold, their legacy trait doesn't generate any gold. So if you want to make effective use of the Carthaginian legacy trait in the era that you're receiving it, you need to have picked ideally the Nubians and potentially the Phoenicians. Um, you know, if you're picking the Carthaginians, you probably had an okay start for the Phoenicians, but you know, you do want multiple good harbor locations. Um, so you have to have picked a good gold generator before picking the Carthaginians if you really want to make effective use of the legacy trait. Now, obviously it does, you know, have effects later in the game as well, like I said. So if you pick like the Dutch in the in the uh, early modern, you are not going to regret having this trait for sure. And specifically, if you have like the Kothan and normal harbors, you can get extra adjacency on like the VOC warehouses and that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's no guarantee that you'll pick the Dutch later or that you'll even want them, right? Or that they'll be available. So this, I, I like the legacy trait to a certain extent, I think the main issue with it is just that gold buyout costs are so ridiculously expensive right now that even with the minus 25% reduction, it still doesn't make it a better strategy than just pursuing a different strategy like focusing on science or production or something like that. So those are my thoughts on the, the legacy traits. So let's talk about the Kothan. Now the Kothan is actually a district that I like a fair bit. When it's relevant, it is probably one of the better districts in the era. And it can provide you with a pretty sizable amount of industry, as well as a fairly sizable amount of growth. It's somewhat comparable to the Haven from the Phoenicians, except the Phoenicians, uh, with their Haven, it generates gold, and it generates less gold than the Kothan generates industry. And the industry is way, way better than, than you know, a marginal amount of, of gold income. So as a result, the Kothan allows you to take advantage of coastal waters um, on top of like having a harbor or a haven or whatever, because you can have multiple, and allows you to uh, get industry from your coastal water. Uh, additionally, because it's a harbor, it means you can buy it out with an influence cost, which is reduced thanks to your legacy trait on outposts that aren't attached. So, you know, it's a similar idea with the uh, Phoenicians where you can buy this out and then attach it to your city so you don't have to use the industry to actually build the Kothan itself. There isn't too much more to say about the Kothan. Um, really, the, the best part about it is that it combines industry and growth uh, in fairly sizable amounts into a single district. It's roughly the equivalent of having like one and a half agriculture quarters and one and a half makers quarters all combined into one. So it's fairly production efficient in, in that regard. Now, obviously, if you don't have coastal water, <laughs> it's terrible, right? If you don't have somewhere to put the Kothan, um, then, you know, there's pretty much no reason to pick the Carthaginians. Uh, the Kothan is one of the stronger parts of the culture, for sure. So if you're in a situation where you're landlocked or maybe you only have one or two good harbor locations, definitely reconsider taking the Carthaginians. In the situations in which they are good, though, they can really shine and get quite a bit of industry and growth out of building these Kothans in a lot of different places. So next, let's talk about the War Elephant, the emblematic unit. And uh, this is a heavy cavalry unit and I believe has the highest base combat strength before you consider any modifiers out of any unit in the classical era. It is 360 production and 2 population with 10 upkeep, so it's very expensive. But it has 31 combat strength. Uh, it's a heavy cavalry, so you know when you attack a units you don't start adjacent to, uh, basically after you move a tile and then attack, um, then you get plus three. And it has trample. So when you're attacking a unit that is weaker than the war elephant, you get plus four. And I believe this is based on the uh, base combat strength before you consider modifiers. So even if you have like a swordsman, uh, that has like a bunch of modifiers that brings it up to 37 combat strength or something ridiculous, the War Elephant still gets trample against them because it's based on that Swordsman base 26 combat strength. So War Elephant pretty much just gets trample against everything in the era. Uh, 
War Elephant is uh, extremely dangerous. Um, it is very, very good, but it's also very, very expensive. So really the use for the War Elephant is that you're going to have a few of these supporting your army, and you're going to use them to strategically take out units that have maybe had a little bit of damage done to them, and the War Elephant can swoop in and finish them off. You're not going to have an entire army full of these things. War Elephants are not good on the front line. It makes them more vulnerable. Really, they want to be making use of their high base combat strength, their charge and trample to uh, eliminate units. So if they're not on the offense, they're effectively losing seven combat strength. And it makes them vulnerable to hoplites and immortals if they're sitting on the front line. It makes them vulnerable to ranged fire, that kind of stuff. So you don't want to be trading defensively with these, so they're not going to comprise your entire front line. But they're very effective in field battles where you can get them to run around and, uh, you know, target like backline units like archers or, you know, maybe there's like a Markabata or something. War elephants will absolutely decimate in field battles uh, if you're using them properly. They do have a two copper uh, resource requirement, which there are some situations where you're not going to have two copper. I haven't found this happens to me super frequently, but if you are very confined, you may not have that access, so do consider that. Most of the time, the two copper isn't an issue, but, you know, sometimes that access isn't available. So where do I put the Carthaginians? I put the Carthaginians in the B tier, uh, along with the Axumites, and I, I do think you could make a certain argument that Carthage could be A tier. I think what's preventing them from A tier in uh, my sort of ranking system is really there's a certain situationalness to them, right? If you don't have a lot of coastal water, you can't make use of the Kothon. If you are not sort of planning a heavy merchants game the constructible buyout cost reduction isn't very good if you don't have access to two copper you know you can't build the war elephants at all right and uh, specifically with the legacy trait it's very difficult to actually make use of because of how ridiculously expensive buyout costs are anyway so at the end of the day i think the effects that Carthage provides you, specifically with the strength of the War Elephant, as well as the production from the Kothon, are better overall than the Axumites. It's just that those things are more situational than the Axumites bonuses. Uh, you're usually going to have the one iron you need for the Shodalai. Um, your Great Obelisk is going to be relevant in most games, uh, you know, if you've invested in religion, uh, which isn't that hard to do. The plus two money on uh, tile is always going to be relevant in every single game you play. So the Axumites are a little bit more reliable, but in terms of their reliableness, they have a trade-off that the things they have aren't as effective as the Carthaginians in the situations where the Carthaginians are good. One thing I forgot to mention about the War Elephant as well is that it's, you know, it has limited use in sieges because it is a heavy cavalry, so uh, point that out as well. So Carthaginians, uh, I've slotted into the B tier. So let's talk about the Celts next, and uh, the Celts have probably the most disappointing legacy trait of the era, which is plus two food on farmers. Uh, this is pretty terrible. Uh, if you've watched my games, you know that I don't use farmers at all. So at the start of the game, farmers provide you plus six food per farmer. One population takes eight food uh, for upkeep. So you can get the granary in the ancients, which brings you up to eight food per farmer. And then you take the Celts, which gets you up to 10 food per farmer. Let's assume you just stayed at, you know, that eight food per pot. You would need four farmers in order to support one additional population. Why would you ever do that though, right? Why would you have four farmers to support that one additional population when you could have those four farmers on science, money, or industry? Because the marginal benefit of it, right, is your the trade-off for that is you have four people on food in order to get one more population that you then put on science, money, or industry instead of just having four population on science, money, or industry. This doesn't make farmers better, really. Farmers are still kind of useless. 
the times you use farmers is to like accelerate growth a little bit. Say you need a pop in one turn and you know it's going to take three and you move some people onto farmers for a turn or two and that's fine that's a totally legitimate use of farmers but farmers just you know food is just not effective in terms of producing it from population food should really be getting produced from things like harbors and agriculture quarters from exploitations the the farmers just aren't efficient enough to warrant uh making farmers you know you want workers and scientists and this plus two food per farmer it's not enough to justify having this contingent of farmers to continue to grow your city because you can easily reach your agrarian stars without having any farmers you just need the proper quarters and the Celts do have the nematen right so the nematen is this agriculture quarter it gives a little bit of faith which is nice particularly if the beta changes go through that'll elevate this a little bit and it gives plus three food per number of attached territories you can get a pretty decent amount of food off of this uh so if you place a nematen down you know you'll be able to get depending on which cultures you've taken in the past you can get like 20 to 30 food somewhere in in that neighborhood depending on the exact placement and the tiles you're exploiting and how many territories you have attached so from the nematin each nematin is going to support you know like two or three populations something in that neighborhood depending on how big your city is already and it does get you a little bit more food if you attach more territories so the nematin is a decent building uh in terms of growth I wouldn't say it's amazing by any means. It is more efficient than just building a regular regular agriculture quarter, right? And as agrarians, you do want to continue to grow your population. Um, and the Nemetin is going to help you do that. It's going to help you support larger population. And the more territory you have, the more effective it is, but also the more of them you can build, right? So it's good on players that have gone for uh, larger cities that have more attached outposts. So if you have five of these, right, each Nematin is giving you plus, sorry, if you have five attached outposts, each Nematin is giving you plus three food per number of attached territories. So if you multiply that by five, each Nematin is providing you plus 15 food. But also, you can have more nematins than if you had fewer territories, right? So you have five nematins with five territories, each providing you the plus 15 food in addition to the extra food that you're getting from exploitation. So it's good on those that have a more condensed set of cities with a large amount of territory attached. The main issue with that, though, is that you are still very stability limited early in the game. Um, you are also influence limited. It becomes difficult to attach more than a handful of territories at the start of the game because you don't have the stability and you don't have the influence production you need in order to make more than say three maybe four attachments by the time you get to the end of the classical era it's just too expensive and too taxing on your city so you are somewhat limited now if you can get bigger because you know maybe you've picked like the Zhou or something in the previous era and you have the stability to support it you might be able to get a little bit more use out of the Celts uh, specifically the Nematin but even within a reasonable frame of like three to four attached territories, you'll get a decent amount of growth out of this. And because you are an agrarian and you can spend influence to steal population, it'll help you support those population that, you, that you're stealing. And since you're stealing population, you know, you don't have to wait for the growth to kick in and to generate you population. So Nebatin, yeah, better than a farmer's quarter for sure. Uh, I would say it's slightly above average in, in terms of quarters, but it's not like an amazing quarter. It's definitely not what it, what it was when it provided food for population. So let's talk about the uh, Gazetti, which is the emblematic unit. And uh, I have a major issue with the design of units like the Gazetti. So the advantage of the Gazetti supposedly is it has this thing called fervor which gives it no combat strength penalty from receiving damage so it is always at its maximum combat strength of 25 it also doesn't require iron which is you know nice it's a nice boost because when you enter the classical era you don't know if you have iron or not 
So units that require iron, if you are picking a culture specifically for access to those units, then, you know, if you have no iron, you're kind of screwed, right? You don't have to worry about that with the Gazetti. The main problem I have with the Gazetti is that it is lower combat strength than a swordsman, so it is 25 rather than 26. And the main problem here is that with swordsmen on humankind difficulty, AI swordsmen always have a higher combat strength than you, regardless of how damaged they are. Uh, or or an equal one if they're, you know, extremely damaged. So there's no there's no scenario in which the Gazetti are actually better than the generic units that your enemy has access to. And Gazetti just get absolutely steamrolled by things like Immortals, Hoplites, War Elephants, Gothic Cavalry. Like, pretty much everything in the era beats the Gazetti. Now, the idea is that, you know, as the Celts, right, you have enough food that, uh, you know, you spam a ton of these Gazetti out. And there is a little bit of merit to that, and I suspect that would be a more effective strategy in multiplayer because the Celts can generate a decent amount of growth. But in the classical era, you are not going to be outproducing the AI. The AI is always going to be able to have a larger army than you um, because of how many buffs it has to its production. Now, it is possible that you like catch them off guard or something and you know they only have like one army running around or whatever, but then why do you need Gazetti for that, right? You can just use regular swordsmen and archers. You know, you just you only need generic units in those situations. So the Gazetti is pretty much worse than almost every other emblematic unit of the era. And it, it struggles against pretty much everything, even if you have higher numbers of them because of the combat strength bonus that uh, the AI are getting and the AI's ability to absolutely just spam out insane numbers of armies. So I rate the Gazetti very low, and this isn't to say you won't have any success with the Gazetti. It's just that you would have more success using virtually any other unit in the era. And between the legacy trait that's basically totally wasted and the relative weakness of the Gazetti, I put the Celts in the C tier. I just don't value them very much in an era where the, um, the emblematic unit is so important. And in the classical era in particular, uh, I feel like needs to be one of the strongest eras in your game. You can kind of get by with a slower ancient era for setting you up, but the classical era is really when you need to start exploding and starting to overtake the AI in terms of your ability to produce specific outputs. And growth is one of the less important outputs, right? Production and science are really king. And although the growth is nice to have, and you know, I you'll remember the Harappans in the last video were S tier, uh, in large part due to their legacy traits. The Celts don't have that same level of growth that continues to provide throughout the entire game, and the Gazetti come at a time where emblematic units are just super super important. So. At the end of the day, I, I don't think the Celts offer enough to pick them over most other cultures of the era most of the time. They're best in a situation where you, say, already have a strong production and or science base, and you need to catch up on growth, and you don't have aggressive neighbors. So if you've picked, like, the, you know, maybe the Babylonians, that might be a little wasted, though. But certainly, like, the Egyptians, or maybe to a lesser extent, the Nubians— and you have a bunch of neighbors that you're at peace with, and they don't have any like real real war supports, and maybe you're trading with neighbors. The Celts can be an okay pick in those kind of situations in order to supplement your growth, um, but they're going to struggle in classical era warfare. And classical era warfare is supremely important, and it happens in almost every single game. So. I I put the Celts in C. They're not like completely useless. They don't have like a single major issue. It's just, you know, some of the things they have are just not really as good as what other cultures offer.
So let's talk about the Goths next, and the Goths get plus 10 combat strength from ransacking on units, as well as plus 2 influence on garrison. Unfortunately for the Goths, the plus 2 influence on garrison does not apply to uh, emblematic quarters that you would think are garrisons. So things like the Cyclopean Fortress or the Dunu and that kind of stuff, they don't count as garrisons. So if you picked the Assyrians or the Mycenaeans, and then you pick the Goths, expecting it to bump up your influence production, you're going to be disappointed. So you have to build generic garrisons for this to have an effect. Now the other effect, this plus 10 combat strength from ransacking on unit, it's a decent effect. You can go uh, declare war on someone, run into their territory, and ransack their admin center before they're able to respond. And then you plonk down your own outpost. You know, maybe you attach it to one of your territories, whatever. And it saves you a little bit of war score in the final deal as well, because you don't need to annex that territory. You've already taken it from ransacking and then plonking your own outpost. You can also get some gold from doing this as well, but keep in mind that the gold you get from ransacking does not apply to your merchant era stars. So the gold is only useful for like finishing up production of something. You're not going to generate enough gold from ransacking to really fuel an economy. So what this is good for is just ransacking things faster before an opponent can respond. And there are some uses to this in classical because there are still going to be some like unattached territories that you can go ransack um, before enemies can attach them. But otherwise, you have to be at war in order to ransack. So, you know, you declare war on someone as the Goths, which you're going to do because you're a militarist. You run into their admin centers, you pillage those, and claim them as your own. It's an okay strategy. Honestly, I find that it is just more efficient to knock your enemy out of the fight earlier and go after their cities. Because you want to get control of the cities as soon as possible and deplete the enemy war score. And ransacking doesn't really do that, whereas taking cities and winning battles does. So I want control of my enemy cities earlier so I can get their production queue and actually make the AI cities useful to me. And if you're pursuing this ransacking strategy, yes, you might take some extra territories, but you're also delaying how, uh, how long the war is going to last, right? It's going to last longer because you're not just going for the kill right from the start. You're kind of delaying yourself a little bit. So um, it, it does have some merits, but it has some drawbacks as well, is what I'm trying to say. So let's talk about the Tumulus, which in the current state of the game is in competition for being one of the worst emblematic quarters of the game. All it provides is plus three faith, plus three influence, and plus two faith per adjacent district. It's pretty trash. Uh, it just doesn't provide you anything you need. You're more than capable of generating enough faith without the Tumulus, and I would not blame you at all if you picked the Goths and never built a single one of these. Uh, t absolutely terrible emblematic quarter right now. Now, with the changes in the beta, if they go through as they are, the Tumulus will really go up in importance quite significantly if you are pursuing a strong religion because it is the quarter that has the potential to provide more faith than any other quarter in the classical era thanks to the faith per adjacent districts so if if you want those religious tenets and the beta changes go through the goss will actually be an okay pick now there are other quarters that provide like a flat plus two or plus three faith but you can't rival the Tumulus because of its adjacency. So it allows you to establish a religion earlier. Right now, it doesn't matter, but in the beta, it may be relevant, and I'm going to hold back judgments of the Tumulus until we see those changes. Uh, but for now, in the current state of the game, the Tumulus sucks. You can get more than enough faith from other sources. The plus three influence, like, fine, yeah, you want influence, but is it really worth building this for a little influence and a little faith over just building a, a maker's quarter or a market quarter or research quarter or whatever no it, it's not it's it's really not so let's talk about the gothic cavalry which is uh the best part of the goths so the gothic cavalry is just this absurdly cheap to produce heavy cavalry unit it is only 90 production right so think about the war elephant the war elephant is 31 combat strength 360 production. It also has 10 upkeep as well as 2 population to produce. The Gothic Cavalry has 90 production, 1 population to produce, and 5 upkeep. 
So for every single war elephant that uh, the Carthaginians produce, the Goths can produce two Gothic cavalry for the same population with half their production cost and the same upkeep. So <laughs> the Gothic cavalry, you can really sustain producing large numbers of them thanks to how cheap they are to produce. And they get this ransacker bonus. So when they're ransacking, right, the bonus ransacking strength doesn't actually apply in battle. It just affects the speed at which you're ransacking. But with ransacker, because there are outposts around or districts around an outpost, when you're defending, when someone attacks you while you're ransacking, if you place your Gothic cavalry on the districts that are around that outpost, they will get this extra plus three combat strength. So Gothic cavalry can be absurdly effective in the open field. And if you produce enough of them, you can just kind of like siege down enemy cities. You don't actually need to assault. You can just wait outside and let your enemy come to you or starve them out. Because Gothic cavalry are really, really difficult to deal with in the field. Just through sheer number and combat strength. Now they are countered by immortals and hoplites like many other units of, of the era. But against everything else, they are very, very effective. And if you can get into like a high ground position against immortals and hoplites, you know, you can do decent damage against them as well with the Gothic cavalry. The biggest issue for the Gothic cavalry, and this is a major issue, is the resource requirements. One horse is not really a problem, but two iron is a major, major impediment for the Gothic cavalry for two reasons, really. The first is that when you go into the classical era, you have no idea whatsoever if you actually have access to iron unless you played the Babylonians and researched a uh, standing army, right? So there's only one culture that you know if you have the resources to get the Gothic cavalry. The second is um, iron is tends to be more sparse than a lot of the other resources. Oftentimes, you will have one iron in your territory. Not always, but often. Two iron does not happen very frequently. There are some exceptions to this. If you played like the Assyrians on Pangaea and have a ton of territory, that reduces the risk you don't have access to iron, right? Because you have more territory, more strategics. But the strategics can be anything, right? They could be uranium or oil or coal or niter, or whatever it is. So you don't know if you have the iron for this. And because of that, the Goths become a major risk with two iron. If it were one iron, it would be more of an acceptable risk. But Gothic cavalry being basically the best part of the Goths and pretty much the only reason you're really going to pick the Goths is for access to this unit, it becomes this major risk that most of the time you're not going to be willing to take. So if you've played the Babylonians and you know you have the iron, you can go up into the Goths. If you pick the Assyrians and you have a ton of land uh, and there's low risk, you don't have access to iron, then you can pick the Goths. Outside of those situations, I there the use case for the Goths is so limited because of how risky it is that you don't have access to the components that you need to produce it. So because of that, because the Gothic cavalry is like the only part of the Goths that's really worth picking the culture for at the moment, I put the Goths in the D tier. Um, and I'm sorry to the viewer who commented on my last video that they'll unsubscribe if I, I rate the Goths slow, because I do like the Gothic cavalry. They are a very powerful unit. If they were only one iron, I would consider putting the Goths either in the C or B tier. But two iron is really, really restrictive. More restrictive than any other unit in the classical era, right? Other, uh, other units that require like two of a single resource are for copper. You're going to know if you have access to that resource or not. And as a result, it makes it less risky to pick those cultures. There's no risk involved in saying, well, I have access to two copper, so I know I can produce this unit. Whereas the Goths, if you don't have access to the iron, you just don't have anything from the culture. Like it doesn't offer you anything beyond the Gothic cavalry. Like, yes, you can ransack a little bit faster, but 
that is so uh, low importance compared to many of the other things that are available within the era that it's you know not really worth picking the goths for alone right so goths you know i'm sorry i want to like them because their play style is so unique but they're so limited by by the resource cost on on gothic cavalry so next we have the Greeks, and the Greeks uh, are a science of sculpture, and they start off, okay, with plus two science per researcher. Uh, this is not as bad, and, you know, I trashed and tarnished the plus two food on Farmer, and you might look at this and say, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. The difference is, is that researchers are still your primary source of science income when you enter the classical era, because unless you pick the uh, Babylonians, you know, you're not going to have access to research quarters. So scientists are like your only opportunity to produce research. When you enter the classical, you'll also have access to two um, infrastructure that will increase the science per researcher up to plus eight, and this plus two science per researcher can get you up to plus 10. It can be a pretty sizable increase to your research output when you first pick the Greeks. As the game goes on, it's not as relevant, but at, also at the end of the game, you know, you might have 100 researchers or more. So that's an extra 200 science per turn, and that's modified by, you know, other modifiers. Now, obviously, research costs at the end of the game are much, much higher, and, you know, 200 science per turn isn't that big of a deal. It's like a few research quarters. But for the classical era, going into the medieval, and to a lesser extent the early modern, you will feel uh, at least a bit of an effect from this. You'll shave off uh, a few turns here or there on certain technologies because of this extra science that you're producing. And unlike farmers, right, researchers are really something you want to have filled up anyway. So you're getting a passive bonus to something that you would already be doing because of how important it is. So for that reason, I value this plus two science per researcher a lot more than I value the plus two food per farmer. And science is really just a more valuable output anyway. So this trade is decent, uh, specifically in the classical era. Uh, it you know the scaling on it isn't amazing, but it does help produce some extra science as the game continues, and it can add up to a pretty sizable amount over the course of the game. It's like you know you'll shave like over two hundred turns. It's like getting a couple of free tax over the course of the game, effectively. So uh, let's talk about the amphitheater for the Greeks, which is the emblematic quarter. Uh, this one's a little bit unique. It is science-based. So you get scaling per era with this. So you get plus one influence per current era, as well as plus three in science per current era. So every era you go up, you get some extra influence and you get some extra science. Additionally, the amphitheater provides plus two science per adjacent district. And you'll notice it doesn't have to be a research quarter adjacent. It can be any quarter that's adjacent to the amphitheater, and it provides you with extra science. You will notice that the amphitheater does not provide a researcher slot, which is a bit of a drawback, because particularly as the Greeks, you want to take advantage of those slots with your extra bonus to researchers. Uh, but it does still provide an okay amount of science output. And uh, I'm actually not sure um, in the classical era if it's technically counted as the second or third era uh, because of the Neolithic, right? So the classical era, if it counts as the second era, uh, you'll basically be getting uh, plus six science from the current era, plus two influence from the current era, as well as extra science from adjacent districts. And then, you know, that increases as, as the game goes on into the medieval and all that kind of stuff. What's nice about this is because it doesn't rely on research quarters for adjacency, you can kind of put it in any city and it'll still contribute a meaningful amount of science to your overall science output. So you can put it in cities that are not specialized towards science because you can surround it with maker's quarters or you can surround it with market quarters or you know whatever other quarter it is that you want and it'll be providing you with extra science from adjacency. Now, does it produce, like, an amazing amount of science? No, but you don't need to uh, really invest anything in order for the amphitheater to continue to provide you more yields as you go throughout the game, which is a nice benefit of it, right? You don't need to produce, like, 
extra infrastructure. You don't need to invest a researcher or whatever to uh, get these extra yields. You just have to continue playing the game, really. So you passively get benefits from it as, as you go throughout the game. Um, now, you know, if you go into the medieval era and say you've built, I don't know, six to eight of these, we'll say six, uh, and you get plus three science per current era, that's an additional plus 18 science when you enter the medieval. It's not really that big of a deal, uh, but again, over the course of the game, that extra science adds up and it'll amount to like uh, a free tech or two uh, as you continue to play the game. The extra influence per current era is also a nice little addition. I found the Greeks are um, not too bad at generating the Aesthete stars because of this. It's not like an amazing amount of influence, but you know, it's okay. The influence is still kind of relevant in the classical era. And uh, ironically, it's more relevant for the non-Aesthete cultures because their Aesthete star requirements are not as high as the Aesthete cultures. And we'll talk about that when we get to the Morians. So anyway, the amphitheater, you know, it's an okay district. It's not, like, amazing. It's just decent. It's still worth building in most of your cities, for sure, because science is obviously a very important output. So let's talk about what really ties the Greeks together, which is the hoplites. And uh, the hoplites are really an amazing unit. They have uh, 180 production cost, just one population, 27th combat strength and require one copper just like the immortals they get the anti-cavalry bonus which again is plus eight rather than plus five and the uh extra effect they get is called the phalanx and phalanx allows units with phalanx to get extra combat adjacency bonuses from other units with phalanx so basically, for every hoplite adjacent to each other, they're getting plus two combat strength from adjacency rather than plus one. And it's pretty easy to have four hoplites adjacent to each other or adjacent to your frontline hoplites in a battlefield. So effectively, if one hoplite has four other adjacent hoplites to it, it is getting plus eight to its combat strength, which would put it up to 35 combat strength before you consider other modifiers. Now, the Hoplites do have a lower base combat strength than the Immortals, but the bonus they get from Phalanx is more reliable because all they j need is just having other Hoplites around, right? Whereas the Immortal requires certain terrain features in order to take maximum advantage of it. So what the Hoplites uh, sacrifice in terms of uh, a little bit of a combat strength debuff, they make up for in being extremely, extremely reliable in terms of being able to get their extra combat strength bonuses. It's very easy to produce a lot of hoplites thanks to their, you know, decently low production cost relative to some other uh, emblematic units of the era. And just like the Immortals, there really isn't a hard counter to the hoplites. There aren't any generic ranged units in the era. There is the Samnahaya, but again, it's an elephant platform, so if the hoplites catch up to it, they're getting their anti-cavalry bonus against it. You know, war elephants can't beat them. Um, Gothic cavalry can't beat them. They counter all the most dangerous units in the era, and they are not really counter themselves. And just like the immortals, this really elevates the Greeks. And at the end of the day, I, I put the Greeks in the S tier. And you may be wondering about this a little bit, because I think I talked more highly specifically about the legacy trait of the Achaemenids than I did the Greeks. And I agree with you that the features that are unique to the culture, the Achaemenids are a little bit better off than the Greeks, particularly because of the plus two city cap. What makes a difference for the Greeks is that they are a scientist culture, which means they can research into the next era, which allows them to grab things like feudalism, which gives them extra food passively and gives them peasants for city defense or they're able to research along the top of the tech tree for extra science output, whatever it is they want. They can research techs from the next era, which is an advantage compared to most other cultures in the game. Also, when you enter the classical era is the start of when you can start using the science mode to convert your production and gold into science. Um, you're not going to be able to make as heavy use of it as you can later in the game, 
but the Greeks will often be able to afford to have a single city with that mode on for several turns, which can really rocket you through the technologies and give you a pretty sizable advantage against some of the other cultures, particularly as you go up into the medieval era and you know have several of the technologies already researched. Um, <laughs> it, you'll, you'll notice the advantage for sure. So the Greeks, although the unique features to them aren't as strong as the Achaemenids, I personally, I think the hoplites are better than the immortals, just uh, by a small margin. Uh, the science is still really useful and continues to be useful throughout the game, and the unique features of the scientist cultures always give scientists an edge over a lot of the other cultures that are available in any era. So uh, the Greeks, you know, although they can't hold as many cities as the Achaemenids, they're very, very competent as militarists and expansionists, as well as generating more science than any other culture in the era. So next, let's talk about the Huns. And uh, the Huns have a simple legacy trait, which gives them plus two combat strength on cavalry units. And this applies to their Hunnic hordes, obviously, and it applies to a few uh, units in later eras. This is mostly relevant in the classical and the medieval eras, uh, when you get like uh, knights and Teutonic knights and Fancy Milites and that kind of stuff. Uh, this can be really devastating actually with if you uh, select the Teutons in the medieval and with the Teutonic knights, right? They have 39 base combat strength. They get that plus six against people with other religions. They get that uh, charge bonus. They get the plus two from this legacy trait. Like the Teutonic knights can just be an absolute terror with this. And then even in the early modern, if you take the poles, the winged hussars will get benefit from this. But largely, it is effective only in the classical and medieval eras, with a few exceptions in later eras, um, depending on which cultures you're picking. But the main benefit from this for the Hans is that it affects their emblematic unit. Um, so, you know, there are some cultures, like I mentioned already, that will take advantage of this, and they do make for a bit of a natural synergy with the Huns as they go into the next era. Uh, the Mongols benefit from this too. I'll, I'll talk more about the Mongols in, in the medieval era video, but I, I do have some major issues with them compared to the Huns. So let's, let's keep going through the Huns because, you know, we all know what the Hun strength is based on, and we'll get to that in a second. So let's talk about the Ordu very quickly. This is a regular outpost upgrade. Uh, I would call it more of a side grade, because when you pick the Huns, you're no longer able to attach outposts or upgrade cities. Um, so the Ordu prevents you from attaching outposts to your cities. So if you want to attach outposts, make sure you do it before you select the Huns. Now, the advantage of the Ordu is that it allows you to spend influence in order to recruit Hunnic Hordes. So let's talk about Hunnic Hordes, because uh, Hunnic Hordes are... Uh, very good. <laughs> and looking at their stat line, you would think they suck, right? 180 production, one population, 22 combat strength with one range. You know, very low combat strength uh, compared to other units of the era. Low range. Obviously, with the legacy trait, this gets boosted up to plus 24. They also have multi-move, which means that they can continue to move until all their movement point points are depleted and they ignore zone of control. So they can run in, they shoot a target, and they run away again where they can't be retaliated against. This also makes them really good in uh, choke points, right? Because you can cycle all your hordes in and utilize your entire army where normally most other cultures aren't going to be able to do that. They also have this nomad trait. So when they win a battle and uh, or when they ransack, they get food. So really with the Hunnic Hordes, you don't want a full stack of them. You want like two to three in an army so that when they're winning battles and ransacking, they get food, which ultimately gives you more Hunnic Hordes. So you can continue to multiply them by doing things, uh, like, you know, taking hostile actions against enemy cultures. <coughs> the real benefit of the horde is that you can buy them on outposts or the ordus specifically what it takes to buy it on an ordu is that the ordu needs to have four population and you need to spend 75 influence which is like really really trivial 
So when you era up as the Hans, the Han Accord has no tech requirement whatsoever. So from the moment you go into the next era, the Hans can go to all their unattached outposts that have four population and spend influence to immediately spawn a full stack of Han Accords. And what this means is that pretty much as soon as you enter the classical era, you can materialize a massive army of Han Accords out of completely thin air. And if you've played against the AI playing the Huns, you know how this goes. Like, you wonder where all these Hunnic Hordes are coming from, because there will literally be dozens and dozens of them. It is so easy to spam Hunnic Hordes. And the, the influence cost is, like, not totally non-restrictive. You will generate enough influence to get a new full stack of Hunnic Hordes every single turn by the time you get to the Classical Era. So... Although they are somewhat lower combat strength, their ability to take advantage of multi-move, the fact that they're ranged units, and the fact that um, you can just produce them basically for free without spending any real important outputs, just influence, which you don't even need as the Hans because you can't attach your outposts anyway. So you get tons of these. And then because you're a militarist, you can do cheesy things like using the militarist ability to... Uh, move your levies from a city to an Ordu, and you disband them in that territory, and then immediately convert them into Hunnic Hordes. Or you can do it with, like, scouts you had left over, or, you know, scout riders or other military units, whatever. So you get, like, two dozen Hunnic Hordes, and then you just roll over everything, because the AI don't know how to deal with these. And the Hunnic Hordes retain their full combat strength in melee as well. So even if they get caught up to, if it's only like a swordsman or uh, you know a lower combat strength unit, it's not that big of a deal if they take a couple hits because they're not taking that melee penalty that a lot of other ranged units do. So the the Hans, they're not good in every single situation, right? If you are late into the next era, it becomes a little bit more difficult because you're facing off against war elephants, you're facing off against Somnahayas and Hoplites and Immortals, all of which are very effective against the Hunnic Horde. But if you go up early to the Classical Era, your ability to spam Hunnic Hordes and the AI's inability to deal with them can basically win you the game, right? You can take over the entire continent in the Classical Era using the Huns. It's so easy to do. And because of that, I am rating Huns in the S tier. And if you go back to my earlier uh, video on the Ancient Era, where I talk about the definitions, the Huns fall more into the category that they're kind of situational in some respects, but in the situations you pick them, they basically win you the game. Because you will wipe out all your competitors on, on your uh, islands or that are nearby you in 40 turns, basically. The Huns can just snowball you so hard and wipe out so many people in your game in the right situations that it's it's amazing. Like, they're really, really good. And the AI just don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to build their cities. They don't know how to use their units such that uh, they can avoid taking fire from the Hunnic Hordes. They will try to sally out to meet you rather than playing defensively and focusing in areas where the Hunnic Hordes don't have access to. So they're very good against the AI, and I think perhaps another factor to consider is that the Huns are very dangerous opponents in the hands of the AI as well. The fact that the AI generates so much influence and in food uh, on their outposts means that they're able to like just continuously spam Hunnic hordes. If you face an enemy that is the Huns, like on humankind difficulty, they already have 26 combat strength, and then if they pick like the Hittites, they'll have 27, and if they get events, they'll get like 28 or 29. If they got Violent Pursuits in the Neolithic, they can get up to like 31 combat strength. They're just an absolute nightmare to deal with if you have to fight against them. Uh, it's probably one of the most difficult units to counter uh, in the game when it comes to the AI uh, using them. And particularly because in the classical era it's hard to have your city developed enough that the Hunnic hordes uh, aren't going to be effective, right? Because the main counter to the Hunnic hordes really is having a city that is developed such that 
it cuts off access to kind of a back line or is uh, has multiple districts surrounding other districts because the Hunnic Hordes only have one range. So you can just sit there and wait out a siege. But the AI, um, you know, the AI don't know how to deal with it themselves. They don't know how to, you know, play that game. They'll just come out to meet you. And it's difficult for the player to have the city developed enough by the classical era that you're able to reliably do that. So not only are the Huns really good, particularly if you're going for an early era up where you're fighting against ancient era units rather than like classical era emblematic units, the Huns will just absolutely destroy everything through sheer numbers. And that's why I've rated them in the S tier. So let's talk about the Morians, who are an S feat. The Morians get plus one influence on emblematic district and minus 10% on attach outpost cost. So the plus one influence on emblematic district, it's okay. It's overshadowed by the uh, liberty ideology, which gives you plus two influence on emblematic districts on the first step and plus four on the second step. Obviously, this combines with it, right? So you get more influence if you're on the Liberty Tree as the Morians than you do as other cultures. It, I mean, it's all right. At this point in the game, right, when you pick the Morians, you're only going to have somewhere between f like five and eight emblematic districts, most likely, depending on how aggressive you were at the, at the start of the game. Uh, so that's not a ton of influence you're generating right off the bat as the Morians. By the end of the era, you know, you could be somewhere between plus 20 and plus 30, depending on how many cities you have, which isn't like an amazing amount of influence, uh, but it is more than other cultures can generate. Influence is still relevant in the classical for attaching outposts and claiming wonders and getting cities online and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, buying extractors, uh, so it, it's not like a totally wasted output, but the value of influence does start to decline very sharply after the ancient era. There are some changes in the beta that may see that change a little bit. We'll see what the actual effect on aesthetes are though. The, the value of influence may not decline so much in the classical era if changes in the beta go through. The minus 10% on attach outpost cost, it's really not that big of a deal, right? If you get into the classical era, like you get this, you get the situation where outposts are either like really easy to attach with really low influence costs, or they have like an outrageous attachment cost. So it'll be like, I think your third is about 270 influence to attach, which is pretty manageable for most cultures. And then your fourth territory is like over 500 influence or something, or maybe 490 somewhere in that uh, area. So minus 10% on 490 influence, you know, oh, big deal. You get to pay like 445 influence or something in that neighborhood. It, it, you get it like a turn earlier. You know, you can attach it a turn earlier than you could with other cultures, but it's just not that important at the end of the day, that 10% reduction on attach outpost cost. So uh, let's talk about the stupa. Uh, the stupa is actually not too bad. So you get a base of plus one influence, you get plus two faith, you get plus three science, you get plus two influence per adjacent district, and you get a researcher slot. Uh, it's pretty good. It provides you a decent uh, variation in outputs, right? So you get a little bit of extra faith to help your religion. You get influence to help uh, get you your Esthete Era stars. And importantly, you get a little bit of science as well. It's not as much science as the Greeks are going to generate given, right? Uh, it's not even close. Um, but it gives you an okay mix of outputs. And, um, you know, you can fit it easily into like a, uh, a research quarter kind of city uh, with the, the science it's going to provide. And it gives you some extra influence per adjacent district. <coughs> so the Morians can actually advance through the ages a little bit faster than some of the other cultures, or at least through the tech tree, uh, thanks to the stupa. Because a lot of other cultures don't have the same access to uh, this extra science as the Morians provide. And you don't have to research the technology that unlocks research quarters in order to build the stupa. So it allows you to like go along the bottom part of the tree to get access to your emblematic unit, which we'll talk about in a second, and still build some, um, still build some quarters that are going to increase your science output, which really starts to become important in the classical era once you get access to research quarters. <coughs> 
So yeah, the soup is okay. I'm not a big fan of the plus two influence per adjacent district. Um, and we'll talk about this now because the Morians are an Esthi, which means they have inflated requirements to get their Esthi to Aristars relative to some of the other cultures, right? So whatever your primary affinity is, it takes more to get those Aristars, but you also get more fame in return. This is kind of an issue with Esthetes uh, until the early modern or so. They often don't generate enough influence to actually reliably three-star their uh, main Aristars in a uh, short amount of time, right? You want to be able to get that as fast as possible, but the Esthete requirements are kind of steep. The scaling on the influence stars is a little bit wacky, in my opinion, considering how much influence you can actually generate if you're actually playing Esthetes. So, you know, if you pick the Olmecs into the Morians, yeah, you can probably do it, right? Uh, but if you're just picking the Morians alone, you're probably not going to three-star your Esthetes stars in a reasonable amount of time. You will get your first star, most likely. Uh, the second star is a bit of a toss-up, depending on the game you're playing. But three stars can take a while. So do keep that in mind if you're playing the Morians. And if you've watched my other videos, you know I value that quite a bit. So finally, we come to what is, in my opinion, the best part of the Morians, which is the uh, Sumnahaya, or however you say this thing. It is a an elephant unit with uh, 360 production costs. It's two population upkeep, uh, or two population produce, 10 money upkeep. So it is very expensive. But it is a ranged unit with 30 combat strength, 6 movement, 3 range, and as an elephant platform, it ignores combat uh, penalties from my fighting in melee. So normally ranged units get a minus 8 penalty when they're in melee. Somnahayas retain their 30 combat strength when they are in melee combat. The Somnahaya is a very, very strong unit. And effectively what you do as the Morians is just have a small front line of swordsmen to take hits, and you just use the massive combat strength on this ranged unit to plink away at enemy units. And it's a very effective strategy. And the main reason it's so effective is because there aren't really any other ranged units in the era. The closest thing you get is the Hunnic Horde. And the Somnahaya is almost double the combat strength of an archer, which is what virtually everyone else in the era is going to be using. So... You have this very expensive but very effective ranged combat platform that also has the movement to relocate across the battlefield as need be. And if it gets caught, it's still going to retain its full combat strength against whatever is attacking it. So if need be, you can still use it to uh, block people and absorb a couple hits. It does struggle a little bit against uh, war elephants. Uh, Gothic cavalry, if there's a large swarm of them, can take on the Somnahaya. And um, hoplites and immortals are kind of like soft counters to these almost. But they kind of each counter each other, right? Because the Somnahaya is a ranged unit, which is what you want against slow melee units. But at the same time, those melee units can punch through your front line very easily, the Hoplite and the Immortal. And if they get to the Somnahais, the Somnahais are dead because of that Anna Cavalry bonus. So it, it depends on your terrain. I would overall rate the Somnahaya like lower than the Hoplite and Immortal because of how consistently strong they are uh, with that Anna Cavalry bonus. But the Somnahaya, in the right situation, you can take on Hoplites and Immortals, particularly if you have a sufficient amount of blocker units. So this 30 combat strength is very potent. It's a higher combat strength than most other units of the era, aside from the War Elephants. And it doesn't suffer the same drawback of the Hunnic Horde, where um, like having a city that's more than one tile deep like totally negates this thing, right? It can fire over three range, just like an archer or you know some other uh, ranged units. So it means they can shoot units that are actually in a city. And unlike some other units, the Somnahaya can fire indirectly, right? So you can fire over obstacles like forests or friendly units or mountains or whatever it is. So uh, this is a great unit. Um, I prefer some other units of the era. But if I am playing a very aggressive game and some of these other cultures aren't available, then the Somnahaya is a great fallback for that.
uh, you know, your melee units aren't going to be as effective, but with the ranged fire support, you're going to be able to take on most other cultures relatively easily. And I think what's underrated about the Morians is that although influence isn't that important, having more influence does allow you to be over your city cap more easily. So they have an advantage relative to the Greeks in some respects, that although I wouldn't rate the Somnahaya quite as highly as the Hoplite, when they are going on the offensive, they're able to retain a larger number of cities thanks to the Morian's influence output. So while most other cultures might be at like four out of three cities, the Morians can usually support being at five out of three, which isn't as good as the Achaemenids, but is still better than a lot of the other cultures you might pick in the era. So because of these reasons, I have slotted the Morians in at the A tier. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of these rankings, as I mentioned at the start of the video, are really based on the effectiveness of their emblematic unit because of how important it is in the classical. I, I did debate putting the Morians in the B tier, but I think at the end of the day, the Samnahaya is uh, such a strong unit relative to some of the other counterparts it has, and the ability of that influence generation to allow you to go over the city cap does elevate the Morians a little bit over some of the other options that are available. So I put the Morians in the A tier. So next we have the Maya, which I'll definitely call the Mayans. Um, so the Mayans get plus two industry per worker on city or outpost. This is uh, reminiscent of both the Celts and the Greeks. The industry per worker, I would say, is more valuable than the food per farmer, but a little less valuable than the science per researcher. It's an okay trait. Obviously, this is better in larger cities that have more workers, right? So the larger city you have uh, and the more workers you have, more industry you're going to get from this legacy trait. Workers are kind of like your uh, number two priority in the classical era. You're going to want to have your full researcher slot since they're your primary research output. And then any extra population is usually going to go into production. Depending on what culture you picked and your terrain, you know, you can have both maxed out. And uh, with the amount of work or maker's quarters you're going to have produced in the ancient era, you'll probably have a few. You know, you can easily have like eight worker slots. So, you know, plus two industry per worker on that is an extra of 16 industry per turn, which is enough to be like an extra maker's quarter or two, depending on, you know, exactly your cultures and your terrain again. So, uh, you know, it's okay. It, it's like getting a, a, an extra maker's quarter or two for free at this point in the game. And obviously, as you get more workers as the game goes on, uh, it continues to be at least somewhat relevant, even though production costs increase quite dramatically. The, what's a little um, weird about this one is that workers are kind of less relevant than researchers the later into the game you go. So relative to the Greeks, it, it doesn't scale quite as well because the, um, the maker, I want to call them maker's quarters from civilization, or am I... Th <sighs> I keep mixing it up. I, I think it is the Maker's Quarters. So the Maker's Quarters um, gets uh, fairly efficient. Uh, science Quarters do as well. But typically you can get by on like just Maker's Quarters alone without needing workers. Whereas research, you really just want as much of it as humanly possible in the late game to rush down the tech tree. Uh, but it does give some options for like if you went full industry early in the game and then you pick like the French and turn on collective mines and you can just rock it through the tech tree. Uh, so, you know, overall, it, it's decent. It, I wouldn't rate it quite as highly as the plus two science per researcher, but it'll still provide you a decent amount of industry uh, throughout, you know, particularly the classical era going into the medieval and a little bit throughout the rest of the game. So let's talk about the Kuna, which is the best part of the Mayans. So the Kuna is uh, reminiscent of the Nemetin for the Celts. It gives plus three industry per number of attached territories, uh, plus two faith, plus four industry per adjacent maker's quarter. So the uh, Maker's Quarter, this is basically just a buffed up Maker's Quarter, right? So the larger your city, the more industry you're going to get from the Kuna. So just like the Nemetin, say you have five territories attached, including like the main city itself, then you're going to be getting plus 15 industry per number of attached territories on each Kuna. But because you have more territories, you can also build more of the Kunas, right? 
So realistically, you're only going to have like maybe three or four attached because of stability penalties and the influence costs to attach uh, different territories. But you'll still get a decent amount of industry off of that. And in addition, you're going to be exploiting tiles as well, right? So the Kuna can generate, you know, enough industry to be worth like two to three makers quarters most of the time. And that means you're saving stability on uh, producing more makers quarters. But it also means that, you know, by building this one district, you're getting your industry online faster. It's a decent district, and I would rate it well over the Nemetin because it is providing a more valuable output on a one-for-one -one basis, right? Uh, the Kuna essentially provides the same amount of industry as the Nemetin provides food. And the thing about industry is that your point of industry is never wasted, right? Every single bit of industry that you get carries over to whatever you're producing next. And that's not really the case with food, right? You, can't, you need to hit breakpoints with food. So each population requires a certain amount of food to maintain. So food isn't useful really until you hit each of those breakpoints for your next population, whereas each additional industry is not wasted. So, and obviously, you know, industry is what you use to produce everything. So I value the Kuna uh, quite a bit higher than I, I value the Nemetin. Um, and, you know, the Mayans being a builder culture, obviously they have access to a uh, land razor, which means they can convert everything in their cities to production. And you'll be able to afford to do this for like five to 10 turns as the Mayans, if you really want to, if you have more than just a couple cities and like really crank out a lot of districts in say a city that you captured that needs to catch up or something like that. So uh, let's talk about the Noble Javelinier. Um, <laughs> Noble Javelinier sucks. It's the same issue as the Javelin Thrower for the Olmex. The one advantage I think it has is that it is 90 production, right? So it's very cheap to produce. It also has 25 combat strength, which isn't bad for a ranged unit. It says three range on the wiki. It is only two range. The issue with the Javelinier is, again, it requires direct line of sight. And if you've played, like, multiplayer games, you know that people avoid taking things like, um, God, what's the tech called? In the medieval era, uh, war summons, where you unlock crossbows so that you can continue to use archers right even though crossbows have like more than double the combat strength of archers so the value of indirect fire is way more than like a little bit of combat strength and this poison effect just doesn't matter right because you're not able to target backline units you can't throw over units or throw over terrain so the fact that you're reducing movement speed and attack range is totally wasted because you're only ever able to target frontline units that are already engaged with you anyway. If this gave like a combat strength penalty or something, it would be a little bit more useful. But as it is, it just doesn't matter at all. And the Noble Javelineers, you know, unless you are in very favorable terrain, it's really difficult to make use of them. And when you take them, it cuts off your access to archers which are just a better unit. Even though they have way lower combat strength, you can always, always, always use them because they can fire over anything. And because of the way minimum damage works, right, they're always useful. If you have enough of them, you're always going to be able to kill something. And yeah, Noble Javelineers, same issue as uh, Javelin Throwers. They are higher combat strength. I would rather have a Noble Javelineer than the Javelin Throwers from the Olmex because of the combat strength bonus. Um... But they're just, they're just not good enough, it's particularly compared to the other units available in the era. And they still receive the minus eight when they are in close combat, right? So if something uh, gets up to them, they have like 17 combat strength. So they'll get absolutely decimated by things like war elephants and hoplites and immortals. Even swordsmen will make very quick work of them if they get into melee, which is really easy to do because they only have two range. So uh, Noble Javelineers really terrible unit. Um, and as a result of that, it means the Mayans can really only get picked effectively in situations where you're not going to be going to war with people because effectively you're limited to swordsmen and horsemen. You're, you will play games as the Mayans where you don't build a single noble javelin here because they're just not very good. 
you might have one or two supporting your army and you know you might be able to get a little bit of use out of them but they're they're just so bad so this puts the mines in a position where they're great if you're kind of isolated very similar position to the celts except they provide you production rather than food and because they provide you production rather than food I'm putting the Mayans in the B tier because production is just a better output than food is. Um, and the my particularly like, I think the plus two industry on workers versus the plus two food on farmers is really what makes the difference here. Because the legacy trait like the Mayans is useful and the legacy trait for the Celts just isn't. Keep in mind though that the Mayans are less capable of fighting wars than the other um the other cultures in the B tier, like the Shodalai and the War Elephants are much more capable at allowing you to at least survive or go on the offensive in the classical era, whereas the Noble Javelinier is basically gimping your ability to do that. So the Mayans, great if you're isolated or if you're playing like a peaceful game, maybe you have non-aggression packs with your neighbors, whatever, you can get a decent amount of production. I do think though that the Mayans are probably the weakest builder sieve in the game at the moment. Um, so I, I find myself not playing the Mayans very often because I play very aggressively in the classical era because honestly it's one of the best eras to play aggressively in if you can secure one of the better cultures because everyone else is going to struggle to beat you. The Mayans don't have that option, but I recognize not everyone plays the same way I do. So uh, for those more peaceful people that have the non-aggression packs, or doing a lot of trade, the Mayans can be a decent option that can get you a fair bit of industry and can set you up to produce things more efficiently in later eras. So let's talk about the Romans, which are the last culture for this era. So the Romans get the legacy trait plus one unit slot for each army and minus 30% army upkeep on army. So this was changed. Uh, they got the uh, addition of this minus 30% army upkeep. It's okay. Um, army upkeep later in the game can be a bit of a big deal if you haven't invested very heavily, heavily in your money income. Um, and, you know, you can have units that are like 50 to 80 money upkeep each for each unit that you possess. So a 30% reduction on that isn't bad, right? But in the era in which you get it, it's not super relevant. You don't typically have the uh, production and population to support like massive armies, particularly when you need to be building other things as well. You will be able to support larger armies, and it might make a bit of a difference, like having you know negative versus positive gold. Uh, but at the end of the day, the difference from this 30% army reduction in the era that you pick the Romans is going to be like having plus 15 gold instead of minus 15 gold, which, you know, because of money buyout costs is not that big of a deal. Now, the unit slot, because of how they changed army upkeep, this unit slot available for each army effectively serves the same purpose as the other effect, right? So when you have more units in an army, the effective upkeep for each unit in that army is reduced, even if the total upkeep for the army is increased because it has more units. So when you add a unit into an army, the cost for each, the upkeep cost for each unit is reduced slightly. So really the Romans are good at reducing the upkeep cost of their armies. It allows them to sustain a, a larger force. And between these two effects, you will probably be able to support like an extra army over your neighbors without having to uh, purchase or uh, build any like market quarters or have picks like the Nubians or the Phoenicians or something like that beforehand. You'll have enough gold um, and, it, you know, particularly if you move a couple pops onto traders to support a decent sized army without having to make that money investment. And if you do make that money investment, your money's going to go a longer way because you're not paying as much upkeep. I would still rate this below average. I personally haven't found upkeep of armies to really be an issue because of how I specialize my cities. Um, and, you know, I recognize other people might play that a little bit differently than I do, but I do think that that specialization is the most effective way to play the game at the moment. And I am trying to rate these as if you are playing the game as effectively as possible.
So at the moment, I don't value this very much, and this plus one unit slot available for each army, because of the way reinforcements work, you know, it really doesn't make a difference in terms of fighting battles. So it's really good for just reducing upkeep. So let's talk about Triumphal Arch. Um, I want to like this. I, it's, it's grown on me a little tiny bit because of how frequently I'm at war. So the Triumphal Arch gives plus three influence and plus three stability as a base. Um, you know, which obviously is not very good. Now, on Victoria Cities, it gives an additional plus 5 influence and plus 10 stability. So on Victoria Cities, you get plus 8 influence and plus 13 stability. And I haven't been able to test this. I originally thought that Victoria Cities, you got victorious when you won a war. But now I suspect you actually get it when you win battles as well, which significantly increases the uptime of this effect, right? The the main issue, though, with the Triumphal Arch, and it, it still does have an issue, is that A, the effect of it isn't very good to begin with, like, even when you have Victoria City, and B, it's still a time-limited effect, right? You have to continue, like, going into conflict in order to continue to get this effect, so, you know, as a base, if you don't have Victoria City, you're just getting plus three influence and plus three stability. But even if you do have Victoria City, is it really worth building the Triumphal Arch for, you know, plus eight influence and the ability to support, like, one extra quarter? Uh, I mean, I found myself building a couple of these for the extra influence generation, but I really think the Triumphal Arch needs like some kind of adjacency effect or something, even if it's only when the city has the victorious effect. Because right now, it's like that extra influence and a little bit of stability is just not really worth building over just building a Maker's Quarter or an Agriculture Quarter or more units or whatever. So yeah, I, I still think Triumphal Arch is pretty bad, even though it is better than it was before. The influence just isn't worth enough. Now, maybe it, with the beta, if, you know, influence costs have significantly increased and you really need more influence, the Triumphal Arch might be better, particularly if you're going to war a lot. But as it stands, you know, you might build a couple of these, but even if you never built a single one, I would not blame you at all. So let's talk about Praetorians. Uh, the Praetorian Guard is the latest unit of the Classical Era that you get at Imperial Power, which is one of the last tacks of the Classical. It's 180 production, just like, you know, many of the other emblematic units, like the Hoplite and the Immortal. 30 base combat strength, so it beats both of those. It has a 1 iron requirement, and it gets tactical superiority, which the uh, wiki list is plus 5, but it's actually plus 3 that Praetorians get whenever there is an ally adjacent to the target. So when Praetorians attack someone and an ally is adjacent to that target, the Praetorians are getting plus three from this tactical superiority. So Praetorian guards are um, fairly good. They're good units. Um, and when you get a fair number of them, you can really do work on the battlefield, right? Like you can beat pretty much anything. Uh, immortals can still beat you if... You know, you if they have like high ground or they're defending, uh, hoplites can still be quite dangerous because of their ability to super buff their combat strength from adjacency. Uh, but Praetorians are competitive with those units, and they can beat pretty much everything else. The issue with Praetorians is how late in the era that they come. Now, the effect of this isn't as bad as it was before. The actual research cost of Imperial Power and the tech before it has been reduced relative to what it was in the beta, so it doesn't take quite as long to get there. But the thing is, is that at the end of the day, the Praetorians aren't really better at combating the AI than just taking the Achaemenids, the Huns, the Greeks, or the Morians you will be just as effective with those other cultures, but the units that you get come earlier, and you get other benefits on top of that. So the Praetorians come really late, and they take one iron, which, you know, you have no idea if you actually have or not until you go up into the classical. Most of the time you do, but sometimes you don't. 
Where I think the Praetorians are really good is when you've played the Babylonians, basically. If you've played the Babylonians and you've teched into the next era, you know, you're getting up to imperial power and you want to expand and you go into the Romans, you can absolutely destroy everything. For the Babylonians specifically, the Romans can be like a B to A tier culture because of how strong the Praetorian guards are and how early you can get them as the Babylonians. For everyone else, they're pretty bad. I put the Romans in the D tier along with the Goths. And it's not that the Praetorian Guard is bad, but it is basically the only feature of the Romans that's really worth picking the Romans for. And the reason you pick the Praetorians is so you can smash other people. It's just that other cultures can do it just as effectively, but also do it much earlier in the era. And specifically, the Achaemenids outshine the Romans because of their plus two city cap. Uh, so they can actually hold on to more cities than the Romans can. But like the Greeks get uh, extra uh, science benefits. The Huns you can take really, really early and just totally roll over the entire continent. The Morians get some benefits to science and influence. Uh, they get the Samnahaya, which is like a ranged replacement in an era where there are no ranged units and they can continue to just use swordsmen as the regular blocker units so romans are just they're just worse than so many other options in the era uh, that i i really couldn't justify putting them uh above a d it, they're just they're their one benefit their one real benefit the praetorians just come too late and don't have enough of an advantage over some of the other cultures in the era to really justify picking them if any of those other cultures are available. Again, the exception is the Babylonians that can really just roll over people by picking the Romans uh, after you know they've already tacked into the classical era texts from the ancient era. So good for the Babylonians, pretty much garbage for everyone else. So that is uh, my classical era tier list. And, you know, obviously this stuff is all subject to change, right? As I play the game, I find myself moving things around up or down a tier. As patches come out, it's going to make this tier list less and less relevant because of changes to the game. You know, maybe influence becomes more relevant. Uh, maybe, you know, there are changes to combat strengths of units. Maybe there are new units or techs added to the game, whatever. So, you know, bear in mind that this list is obviously subject to change, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this tier list as well. And, um, you know, I, I do take all that stuff into consideration, and I'd love to respond to those comments, as I'm sure many of you have noticed in the past. I will say, uh, closing out here, that there is a massive gap between, like, the top tier and the bottom tier in the Classical Era. Uh, I, I think the Classical Era, aside from perhaps the contemporary era is the era that most needs a balance pass because of the power gap between uh, emblematic units specifically uh, across all the different cultures. So the, uh, the classical era for me is like w the most important era to get the pick that I want. And I will sacrifice era stars in the ancient era in order to get access to like the Achaemenids or the Greeks uh, if I am uh, really in a position where I want to pick them. So that being said, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. I really appreciate it. We'll be working on the uh, medieval tier list and beyond very soon, so keep an eye out for that. And I'll be back as well with some uh, more gameplay and some other videos in the not-so-distant future. So thanks everyone, and I'll see you next time.